Yeah. Um, so I hope you enjoyed your weekend. Um, it's a little sparse here, guys. Yeah, okay. I see people walking away. Um, so, okay, so, uh, uh, everybody, did you do the last set of home? You read the notes, right? And, and, are the, do you have any questions about the notes? No? And, um, the lab is coming up really soon. So, okay, I know it got a little, it gets a little dry at this point. Because you'll say, well, what does this have to do with image processing? But now we can start a lab, and the lab is on image restoration. So, image restoration is sort of a very simple inverse problem. So, um, um, uh, you're going to get started on that. So you have to do the lab, and you basically just download I think you can use them all in that lab, or maybe you didn't do it in two days. Okay. So, uh, for those who have never programmed today, um, I'll hopefully find a good URL for you. Um, I have a set of tools there uh, for programming in C. Um, people at 6637 have been through this before because uh, they've written simple C programs. Um, uh, but uh, uh, now, um, so I guess this chapter of the notes then explains basically how you do the lab. Okay, so maybe that's motivation for reading. But then, uh, if you understand the, the chapter, it pretty much goes through step by step. Also, there's a lot of information in the actual lab itself that explains everything. So maybe I can go over to the computer and just walk through the lab real fast, just so you can see it. And actually, this first lab we break up into two parts. Like I have. I forget when the due date is for it, but it's on. Now, the lab that we'll uh, collect and will be graded, okay? So, uh, get them in on time. And when you do them, I think you'll find that hopefully you understand the material a lot better. Some of this that might have been seemed a little bit abstract will be more concrete once you do the lab. Okay? And, um, uh, good. Any questions? Now I'll go over to the, the computer. Um, let's see. So I'll just show the lab. My course is Purdue. What's that? Yeah. Oh, Blackboard. Mm, okay, I don't use that. Uh, Google. And are the lecture videos working okay then? Do you not have any problems with them? Um, here's the lab. So you go down here, this is the map restoration lab. So there's some C code here. Um, you know, uh, so you, see, you should first download this C code and just compile it and run it. It's just some silly little thing that, like, makes some simple manipulation of an image, maybe adds some noise so you can tell a random number generator goes. And, but it gives you the basic understanding of how you write a C program. So if you want to get this compiled, using your favorite Angie C compiler. So you can get Angie C compilers on any computing platform, uh, on Windows or on Mac or on Linux, okay? And then this is the actual procedure. Uh, and Speed up browsing by disabling add-ons. You know what that means? What do I answer to this question? Huh? Just hit that X? Okay. Open. Didn't I hit open? There it is. Okay. Now. Okay. So you see, this explains the theory. You can pretty much go through here and it gives you sort of the bare bones explanation of the theory. But the notes in the, the notes, the class notes give you a little more detail. And you implement this. How come it's all hanging up? Oh, there it goes. Uh, I have you solve the op so we're going to see we're going to have a map optimization problem, then we're going to solve it with coordinate descent. So you're going to implement this in C. 
and then you're going to um, produce some results. So now, uh, oh gosh, this is really slow. Okay, so I think you do up through section six for the first lab. So that in includes the deblurring operation. So you blur the image. I think you either blur the image yourself or I blurred it for you, I forget which. Um, and then, and then when we get into seven, that's like, uh, we cover, that, that goes ahead a couple chapters. So you don't have to do that section, okay? Um, it's, we're, we'll have to, after we do this section on some simple, like image processing, then, um, then we'll go back to some theory again. Because I know the theory kind of gets dry if, if, if you don't see why you're learning it. So hopefully, after you do this lab, you'll understand, well, you'll have some better understanding of what, why it is that we uh, are learning this theory. And by the way, uh, the title of the, of the lab is Map Image Restoration, right? So, um, uh, and then also, I just want to point out that uh, the due date, Open. You can it. Huh? You didn't click on open, you can't pull it. Oh, what did I do wrong? Yeah, you, you can't pull it. Just click on open. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. And over here, uh, let's see. September 27th. We have a little bit of time. Parts 1 through 6. So, by the way, uh, you asked me a question in the last class. So, so we're going to do this lab, okay? And the, the, one of the purposes of the lab is that you're going to look and you're going to see, oh, we're going to use what we learned to do image restoration. And then you're going to say, oh, well, it's not going to be a particularly great image restoration algorithm, but you'll do something, okay? And you'll say, oh, that's why we learned this, okay? And you'll say, well, was it just a math course? No, it's an engineering course because we're solving a problem. The problem we're solving here is mass image restoration, okay? Okay, uh, and then, uh, yeah, that's sort of the theme of the course. Okay, good. So the next thing I'm gonna do is, are there any questions? Okay, so document camera. So, um, okay, so we're now, now I'm doing, okay, mass estimation with Gaussian priors. So we just spent a variety, we spent a lot of time talking about Gaussian priors. You say, well, that was nice, but what, who cares? Okay. Well, the reason we care is we're going to use those prior models to model images. Okay. Well, you say, well, who cares about modeling images? Well, we're going to need models for images in order to be able to extract information from signals. And you say, well, why would you need a model for an image to extract information from signals? Well, this is an image processing course, right? So the signals that we're going to receive are signals that tell us something about images, okay? In the end, usually the objective is to like form an image or analyze an image or do something with an image, right? So we need to extract the information, okay? And the best way to extract the information is to have a model. If you have no idea whatsoever what you're looking for, it's hard to find it, okay? But if you have an idea what you're looking for, then it's a lot easier to find it. And the model is our idea of what we're looking for. Okay, so does that make sense? So you can read this introduction, but this introduction says basically that in so many words. Okay, so now, this is whole Bayesian thing, okay? And we talked about Bayesian estimation. But so basically what happens is this. That um, you, um, uh, that, okay, you, you want to estimate X, okay? So you have, um, you have, um, uh, um, okay, so you have uh, a model for the image. The model for the image is going to be the probability distribution of y given x. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not a model for the image. That's a system model. This is a system model. Okay? Because y is the output of the system. It's some kind of usually measurement system. It's very often an electronic system or something like that. And, and the input, the input to this thing is x, okay? Mm -hmm. And, um, well, there's different ways of drawing this, but the way I draw it, there's actually a better way of drawing it, but I can't remember. That what we also have is that, well, x isn't just anything. x is generated 
with some prior distribution we call P of R, okay? And now the output of that thing uh, would be uh, our estimate, okay? That's going to be uh, one, okay? And then, well, it's a real physical system. Right? And that produces the real Y, okay? But our estimate of Y and the real Y are not going to be the same thing for various reasons. Well, one reason is that um, the real thing um, uh, has, usually has noise in it, and our mathematical model is not correct, right? There's error, there's always modeling errors. There's a, uh, a saying which is that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Okay. It's an oldie but a goodie. I know I've said it before, but it's an oldie but a goodie, but it's true. Okay? The, this model is mathematical. It's always wrong, but it might be accurate enough. So then what would happen is we feed this back and we're going to do optimization. Okay? Now, in addition to this, things will get a little more complicated because what may happen is that uh, we'll have maybe some unknown parameters. Uh, of the system. So I use three letters for the unknown parameters. So it might be that there are things about that we don't really care about directly. They're not things we really need to know, but we only need to know them because the thing we wanted to know X depends upon. Okay? So for instance, this could be maybe the focus parameters. If this is a microscope, so let's say this is a microscope, then the microscope might be a little bit out of focus. So this parameter here tells us how out of focus the microscope is. Uh, or this, this parameter here can describe how smooth uh, this distribution is. Because we might actually have a family of distribution. So along the way we might have to estimate these parameters, okay? That's sort of a little more advanced, okay? But, so we can do this as an estimation problem. We could calculate the conditional expectation of x given y. That would be a possibility. The problem is to do that is expensive usually because uh, we have to actually compute the expectation requires that we compute an integral, right? Right. Um, so, um, uh, so mostly we avoid that. Um, there are some methodologies that work based on computing this expectation, but but it's not probably the most common approach. I mean, you know, if we come back in 20 years, maybe this is the way everybody's going to be doing it because. Effectively, this is harder to do, okay? So people tend not to try to do it today. But maybe in the future, they'll do it. Actually, when I was a graduate student, uh, I will, I was a graduate student at one, one of my institutions. So I will, the institution of which this happened to me will remain nameless, and the instructor will remain nameless. But some instructor had the nerve to tell me that, like, you always had to assume things were Gaussian in order to be able to do anything interesting. And I remember distinctly thinking in class, being the kind of person I am, that when I was told that, the first thing I was going to have to do is go out and find something that wasn't Gaussian, and so that you could do something interesting with it. Okay. And now, almost everything is done with, that's interesting with things that are in Gaussian. Well, maybe that's an overstatement. But a lot of things are done with things that aren't Gaussian. So, as soon as I tell you not to do it this way, the first thing you should want to do is go out and do it this way. Okay? So, Anyway, so what are you going to do? So instead, this is the minimum mean square error estimate. Instead, we're going to use the math estimate. Okay? So it's the uh, arg max over x of the probability of x given y. Okay? Okay? So, um, good. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So if from the last chapter, you know that are the math and the, and the uh, minimum mean square estimates the same? Mm. Not always. Are they sometimes the same? When are they the same? In the Gaussian case. So, okay, so of course we'll have to do not that case, okay? And um, sometimes the math estimate is terrible, but often it's okay. It's the most probable result given what we've observed. So now this is like interesting because you can take huge problems, 
here's a complicated problem. And you could say, well, I'm going to find the value of x, which is most probable, <coughs> given all my observations. This could be like terabytes of data. Y could be terabytes of data, petabytes of data from like airborne sensors and like all kinds of stuff, right? It could be information you extracted from Twitter. It could be whatever, okay? okay? This is a very general framework for solving any problem. So if you're trying to estimate, um, I don't know, uh, the uh, correct price of, well, maybe that's not an S, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of something you could estimate, sort of an unknown property of the world. Uh, estimate the, um, uh, uh, the number of people who would like to purchase um, uh, bachelors. Okay. And then this could be Twitter things. I'm not even sure what Twitter is actually, but Twitter, there's some kind of thing that happens in Twitter, right? They send like a sequence of symbols. <laughs> okay. How many people here have a Twitter account? Oh, wow. I'm <laughs> 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 among friends. <laughs> For those people in the studio audience, the answer was zero. I'm really amazed. Oh, well, what's all this Twitter stuff goes to Okay. Okay, but let's say you did have Twitter account, then there would be some kind of thing that happens, right, and it gets broadcast to the world. And then from that, you could take all that information, that would be like the sense data, and you could estimate the number of people who want to buy spatulas, okay? And you could solve crazy problems <laughs> using this framework, okay? okay. You've got to stop now, and just keep getting work. Okay, now, what happened is this. Um, so we're going to have, so this is the way it often works, okay? You might have like, okay, Y is some observation, right? And then maybe it's like Y is, say, a linear transform of some X. It could be a nonlinear, but let's just say it's linear to make it simpler. And then to that, let's say you add some noise, right? Oh, yeah. So if we don't have a Gaussian distribution for X, mm -hmm. then which model shall we choose for the estimate? Oh. The well, okay. In this class, we're mostly going to take the map estimate. Yeah. Not because it's good, but just because okay. you can do it. <laughs> okay. I mean, well, what mostly people do is they just... Is even for non Gaussian model, you choose the map estimate? Yes. No, more for noun Gaussian, they tend to choose the map estimate. So, okay, there's no estimator that's uniformly better, okay? It's uniformly best, because it would require that you have a definition of best, okay? So, the conditional expectations is minimum mean square error, always, independently of the distributions of their variables are. So, when you don't know the distribution, it's better to have uniformly low thing rather than just satisfying a point? Um, yes, that's true. And this is minimize, globally minimizes squared error. So if square error is your criteria of badness, okay? Then this is optimal, okay? This is optimality criteria is, is is the probability that your answer is correct, which is kind of a third optimality criteria. Because like your the can't probably your answer is correct is going to be essentially zero, right? I mean your answer is never perfectly correct. Okay? So this is almost an indefensible criteria map, but um, it's a whole lot better than alternative criteria which are, are you know are based on nothing in particular. At least it's based upon some framework. I mean, you're like, okay, I'm assuming I have a conditional distribution. I mean, it's a it's a it's a reasonable estimator. Okay, for some class of distributions, it's going to give you a consistent estimate. It's not absurdly bad. Okay, 
like as in makes no sense at all. Okay, <laughs> okay, which is mostly what people do. Like for instance, um, okay, let me come back to this. And okay, so like, uh, I, but I don't want to go too far off track. So I'm going to rewrite one in these papers. But let's say you have this y equals a x plus w. A very conventional solution to this problem is take x hat equals to a transpose y. That's the max filter, or sometimes what they call back projection. Okay, or um, and Sara has a name too. Okay, uh, so this is con considered like really terrific. Okay, well, it's like. It's bizarre. Okay, it's a strange thing to pick. Why? I mean, it turns out that well, there is some motivation for it, but you know, what are you going to get? The result's going to be a transpose a x plus a transpose w. Well, this thing is an x, and the only way this is x is, is if a is orthonormal. So there's a lot of things that people do, and this is actually fairly principal. So there's a lot of ad hoc things people do, right? They just do something, okay? They write a program, they know what the answer has to be, and they start trying to do something, okay? And, you know, like, um, uh, it's nice that, I'm glad that there are people out there who don't just sit around waiting and try. I mean, you have to applaud their initiative. They did something. It's a whole lot better than not doing anything. But it's really quite unprincipled, okay? So then once you put it into a statistical framework, well then, um, at least you're trying, attempting to uh, apply a model to the data and a model to the, pro uh, to the distribution of the product, and you're trying to formulate some statistical estimator, but there, you could formulate some kind of optimal statistical estimator, but at least the map estimator is something, okay? So it's a, it's at least a lot better than doing something completely ad hoc. Okay. So this is much more computationally tractable than this, because typically, because typically this will require computing a high-dimensional integral in order to compute the expectation. This only requires an optimization, which is really easier to do. There are specific, particular uh, cases in which this integral can be computed analytically, and we'll talk about them in the class. But, so mostly we're going to deal with this, not because it's better than this, but just because it's doable, okay? And it gets you 95% of the way there. It's a lot better than doing the, uh, than just doing something completely ad hoc, right? If they're Gaussian, two cases are the same, but in practice, for real data, images are typically not Gaussian. So uh, that's not a good assumption. Okay. So now, okay, so now this is the framework. So we have y equals ax plus w. It could have been a nonlinear function of x, and it might not be added to noise. Like, uh, this could be Poisson noise. So sometimes people say Poisson noise is multiplicative. It's not really, but uh, in other words, it's Poisson noise is the noise you get due to counting of a discrete event. So the underlying phenomena is the mean of Poisson random variable. But the actual observed Poisson random variable is a discrete distribution, right? So it's not additive noise, the key issue. But let's just say here we have additive noise, and the noise is independent of x. Right. And this is, say, um, I'll even generalize this a little bit over the notes. Uh, this would be, say, normal with mean zero and variance, say, lambda inverse. So. Uh, lambda is a diagonal matrix, typically, and precision matrix is the inverse covariance. So, uh, so then the conditional. Now, maybe I think by this time you've probably thought about this. The, in this case, the conditional distribution of y given x uh, is is equal to a normal distribution with a mean of a x, right, and a variance of uh, lambda inverse, right? Okay. Um, so, uh, so basically, if you know x, then the mean of y is ax, and its variance is the same as the variance of w. 
All right. So I can write down the distribution for this, and it's equal to, I'll just put here 1 over z, uh, exponential of minus 1 half, okay, uh, and then this becomes uh, uh, the norm of y minus ax norm squared, and then this becomes lambda here. Now, this notation here, if I put a norm and I subscript it with a matrix that's finally definite, that means uh, this is equivalent to uh, y minus ax transpose lambda y minus ax. So it's just a quadratic form where uh, positive definite matrix lambda is the quadratic is the matrix, right? So, um, okay, so, and being here I can always calculate because uh, it's, it's only going to be a function of lambda. Now, and then I have some sort of distribution for x. So it's going to be, uh, say, uh, normal with uh, mean zero and, say, covariance b inverse. So b is the precision matrix. So that, that's going to be equal to one half exponential of minus one half x transpose d x. All right? Yeah. Before we get too far, um, in the notes you mentioned that, so like right at the beginning of 5.1, mm -hmm. you mentioned that uh, it's kind of like y equals ax plus w, that a has to be non-singular. Uh, yeah. I only meant, I only said that because, um, uh, to keep things simple. Okay, yeah. In general, a isn't going to be, uh, I assume that A is, is square and non -figurable. Later on, I actually start dropping those assumptions. Okay. And the reason I did is only because that allowed me to do some sort of calculations that help make it a little clearer. Okay. Yeah. Good question, though. Okay. So now, so now that you have, so this is the forward model, and this is the prior model. Yeah. So, like, uh, when you're taking the probability distribution of P by given A, the variance is coming from W only, why not from X or? From just from W. Yeah. Right. From, from X to Y. No. Because it's the conditional distribution of oh. volume and X. So this is a really important point. Your question is an excellent one. I get really good questions in this class, by the way. So please keep asking them. I've also gotten a lot of really good email questions. Um, yeah, I mean, um, so, so the way to think about this, I mean, I'm really just providing a hand-waving argument here, right? But you can set this up in a formal framework and do all the calculations exactly and prove it, okay? But the way to think about this is that I'm looking at the conditional distribution of y given x. So if I know x, then what's the distribution of y? Well, if I know x, the mean of y is ax. And then its variance will be about that point. So the variance is, is the variance of W. And the variance of W is lambda inverse. And remember, when I do a, if when I write the a multivariate Gaussian distribution, I put the inverse variance in the expression, not the variance. Is this clear? But I, the way you just said, oh, I could just say, I could see in your eyes, the moment you said, oh, all of a sudden it's getting clear. And once it's clear, it's really simple. But if you're like not clear about this, it's better to be clear, like admit to your confusion and ask the question now, okay? So I can explain it to you because otherwise this will trip you up later. Read the notes carefully. So that, that's saying that the traditional <coughs> distribution, like the, the, the filter A, or like the blurring operation of A isn't reflected in the conditional distribution? Is that what you're saying? It's just it is, but only through the mean. Okay, like not through the variance? Right, because okay. the variance we're saying the noise is added. So it's like in the system model here, for now for the, if it, our model for the system is basically you have x, right? And x is a random variable, but it goes in and the first thing it does is it gets multiplied by x. So the output of that is going to be a times x. And to that, then I add this noise, w, and that produces y, right? So the mean of y, the conditional mean of y, is ax. 
but the noise gets added later. Now, in, this is a simple model, and, and it's not always appropriate. Like, for instance, if you have plus on noise, right, then the variance of the noise is proportional to the mean, okay? So, um, does the noise growth, the plus on random variables are kind of, um, so let's say, um, what's a good letter for a plus on random variable? Uh, it's discrete, so I guess I'll use K. K gets overused in this class, but I hate to use it, but let's, let, I'll use K, then erase it from your mind immediately afterwards. So K is plus on, right? So at, and this distribution, I should be able to write down a plus on random variable, okay? E to the minus lambda or something like that, on lambda to the K over K factorial, is that right? Okay, yeah. Oh, thank goodness. I'd have some chance of passing the qualifying exam. <laughs> okay, so now, um, this is a, a, a random variable, right? It's a positive discrete random variable, okay? The expected value of k is 1. It, it's actually, it's lambda, I think. Is that correct? Yeah, unless I wrote it wrong. Okay, it's lambda. Okay, yeah. Okay, and the variance of, of k, okay, and by the variance I mean the expected value of k minus lambda squared, right? That's equal to what? That's equal to lambda. Okay. So the mean and the variance are both lambda, okay? Now, what's the standard deviation? Okay. Huh? It's the square root of lambda, right? So the um, F and R, the signal of noise, right? How do you calculate the signal of noise? Well, the signal of noise is the see this is an engineering course. Don't ever tell me it's not an engineering course, okay? Well, okay, you might think it, and it might actually be true, but don't ever tell me that. <laughs> okay, no, I'm kidding. Well, maybe I'm not kidding. I don't know. Anyway, what's this SNR? It's the signal energy divided by the noise energy, right? So what's the signal energy? <laughs> the mean is, it would be lambda, and the energy is the squared, squared right? And what's the noise energy? Lambda. So the FNR increases in lambda. See, normally, the signal noise ratio increases if you have additive uh, Gaussian noise, say. The signal noise ratio increases as the signal squares. Before a plus one random process, the signal noise ratio increases as the signal is proportional to the signal, right? So it's like mm, the, the square root of this signal in the ratio. Well, okay, yeah. So it increases sort of at half the rate in in a log scale, okay, uh, of the normal case. But but the, uh, the other thing that's a little odd is that as the signal gets stronger, noise gets stronger. The variance increases, okay? It's just that it doesn't increase as fast as the signal increases. So the overall signal noise ratio goes up. It's a little counterintuitive because, you know, if you have a really strong signal, say a really strong optical signal into a photon counting detector, the noise goes up, not down, it goes up. But the signal noise ratio goes up too because the signal energy goes up faster than the Okay. So this is a real common situation. So in this case, an additive noise model would be wrong because it's not just the mean of the signal that changes; the variance of the noise changes too. In fact, the variance of the noise becomes like proportional. So essentially, what happens is it's almost like you take this signal and you have to multiply it here and then add a pro the product. It gets a little complicated. Okay, we'll deal with that later. But let's just do the first simple case where we just add the noise. This, this framework allows for all this, these possibilities, okay? 
just for the moving general framework, you can solve any inverse problem this way. It's almost embarrassing. Because what happens is someone calls me up on the phone and they go, well, I have $150,000 to give me. Can you solve my problem? I go, sure. Here is the solution. And then somebody else calls me up on the phone. And they go, I have $150,000 to give me. Can you solve my problem? I go, sure. Here's the solution. Okay? So it's like, oh, you're like, for so the same solution solves everybody's problem. It's like capitalism in action. Okay? So anyway. Um, now, uh, blah, 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 blah. So, okay, so it's a beautiful thing. You can solve all these beautiful problems. So, but I first need to start, okay, now how are we going to do this? So now what happens is we're going to kind of map estimate, okay? So the map estimate is going to be the arg min max over x of the probability of x given y. Now, it could be that you would just know this distribution of x given y, okay? And then you'd be good to go. But usually that's not how it works, because usually you have an inverse problem. Usually you have proof of a system, and you're, you can characterize the system. You know what the measurements, how the measurements will relate to this, to the input, because there's some kind of physics and so forth that you can model. So how are you going to do that? So what do you think you say, well, okay, I'm going to use baby law, and I'll say, well, the R max over x, I'll take the joint probability of x and y over the probability of, of y, right? Yeah? Okay? Now, what the beauty of this is, is that um, I don't care about the probability of y because uh, I'm maximizing over x. And I don't care about what the value of the thing is that I maximize. I only can care about what argument produces that maximum, right? So this thing doesn't matter. If I'm solving an optimization problem and I take the cost function and I add or add something to it or multiply by any positive constant, it doesn't matter, right? So I can just get rid of this. That is the beauty of this whole thing, okay? I can drop multiplicative constants. Then what I can do is I can say, well, this is the arg max over x, and I can say, say, well, this is I'll write this as p of y given x times p of x. Why do I write it that way? Because I can calculate. I usually, for physical reasons, I can model the distribution of y given x. That's my physical instrument, and p of x. That's the that's the model I've adopted for the data. That's a little bit of a dicier issue, <coughs> but I can do it. And then, I, well, this thing here is equal to the arg max over x of, now what I can do is take the log of this, and I get the log of p of y given x, plus the log of p of x, right? And then what I do is I say, well, I prefer to do minimization because I think it's easier to think about. Mostly I think it's easy. I've decided the reason why minimization is easier to think about is because gravity pulls things down, you know? And usually, like, the variable, uh, you know, so, uh, when we plot things, right, you, you have some sort of surface like this, and this is like a ball, and it rolls downhill, right? And usually, uh, the coordinates is just the y points up, right? So it's a lot easier, at least for me, to think about minimization than maximization. So the ball will eventually make it here, and this thing here is going to be x um, max. Okay? It's the value that um, it's the value of the argument which minimizes the function. Right? So here I get that minus log p of y given x minus log p of x. Okay, now, the key idea here is this, that this is the system's log. If I ignore the term, the second term, and this is the prior model. So the first term, log of p of y given x, that's the system's model, and, or the forward model, and the log of p of x, that's the prior model, if I just minimize the system model, that would be the maximized estimate. Okay? But that's not necessarily going to be good because it could overfit the data. 
So I, I also put in a prior model. Now, if I only use the prior model and I ignore the data, that would be like how administrators make decisions. They make decisions without using any facts, and they just make whatever decision was the same as the last one. Okay? That's over regular. Now, if you completely follow the data and don't follow the information, any kind of reasonable thing at all, then it's under regularized. You must have had friends in, over years that were under regularized, right? You like said, um, go buy me some jelly beans. And they came back in three days and you said, where were you? And they said, uh, I had to go to China to buy jelly beans. You said get jelly beans. I said, uh, or, you know, or they misunderstood you and they thought you meant Chinese jelly beans, right? And you said, well, before you went to China, why didn't you just ask? I mean, you really think I was going to ask you to go to China to get jelly beans? And they said, well, I didn't know, okay? That's sort of under-regularized, right? You, know? you, don't, you don't try to uh, match your, object, your data with the objects with your prior experiences at all and just do a sanity check of whether it makes any sense, okay? Over-regularizing, you completely ignore the data and you just see what you did before, okay? Somewhere in between is, this, is the Goldilocks solution, okay? You know who Goldilocks and the three bears are, okay? So, um, okay, you may have heard this before if you have been subjected to my lectures, where, uh, you know, there was like Goldilocks was this little girl and she went off on a walk in the woods and she found a house, okay? And the house has three little bears, three bears that live there, okay? There was a mama bear and a papa bear and a baby bear, right? And um, she went in first and she said, she, she was hungry, so she ate some porridge and she said, oh, this uh, porridge is too cold. She ate the baby bear porridge, okay? And then she ate the other parts and she said, oh, this, this porridge is too hot because she was the papa bear's part. And then she ate the mama bear's part and she said, oh, this porridge is just right, okay? And then she like went to the bed and it was too soft and too hard and just right and the whole thing. And then they came home and she went, she was scared and she ran out and ran away. And in the politically incorrect version, the bears ate her, okay? But they don't usually tell that one. And then, okay, so if you ever read in the newspaper about the Goldilocks solution, what they're telling you is the solution that's just right. It's not too hot and it's not too cold. It's just right, okay? So, see, you're learning something about American culture in here. <laughs> so now, uh, okay, so, so the deal is this. You need to find the solution. So if you put these things together, and of course you're going to read the notes, okay? I'm just providing the inspiration here. That what's going to happen is if you solve this, if you set up this problem, you're going to get the map estimate is going to be the value of x. It's going to be the value of x that minimizes the sum of the norm of y minus ax squared plus uh, the norm of uh, um, x d, okay? So uh, this is, uh, well, I can write it out a little bit more detail. So the r min over x, uh, you'll have here uh, y minus ax uh, transpose y minus ax, and then plus x transpose bx. Then you can solve that, and if you solve it, just the root square solution, you can do a closed form solution. And the closed form solution is on, is um, oh the closed form solution is is what? What is the closed form solution? Uh, the closed form solution is um, a transpose A plus B inverse, okay? Um, yeah, A transpose Y. Now, in the notes, it's a little more detailed because I provide the case where there's a void variance sigma squared, and I allow for a scaling factor in B, uh, some other things like that. But basically, this is correct, okay? Now, you say, okay, so that's done. So now we're finished with this class, right? Well, the problem is with that this is very hard to compute because if this was, let's say, a one 
thousand, one million, if let's say you have a, a, a volume, which is 1,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels. So that's a, that's a billion pixels. So this image is going to be 10 to the 9, A is going to be 10 to the 9 by 10 to the 9. Okay, A is actually sparse in some cases, like if it's tomographic, but A transpose A is not sparse. Okay, so this is a dense matrix with one, what tends to be 18th entries in it, okay? And then you've got to invert it. To invert a matrix of size n, it's an order n cubed operation, okay? To invert an n by n matrix, okay? So that would be n to the 6. So it would be like 10 to the 18th raised to the third power. So that's going to be 10 to the, uh, what's 3 times 8? 27, 57. <laughs> okay. Good luck, okay? <laughs> that is a big number, okay? You're not doing it, okay? So that's not practical, okay? So, so why are we even talking about this? Okay, well, what we're going to do is go back and forget everything you're going to learn, okay? And start all over again. And we're going to go back and solve this optimization problem numerically. We're not going to try to solve it as, even though it has a closed form solution, the closed form solution is way too hard to do. It's a lot easier to just do the optimization problem because we don't really care about getting precision of, of, of say, if you're finding, um, like, if you want to calculate sine x, you want the CPU to give you precision which is accurate to the, the precision of the floating point number, which is one part in 10 to the minus 16 or something. Okay, if it's self-precision flow. So you don't need that kind of precision. If you can get a 1% accurate solution, that's plenty of good for this kind of an application. Because, uh, so you will use numerical optimization methods. So the rest of this chapter, we're going to be talking about optimization. The other point I want to make is that the, the ML estimate, the maximum likely estimate, okay, if you just fit the data directly, what would that do? It would just say, well, just take A inverse Y, okay? But that might be horrible, okay? Because let's say the eigenvalues in A have a spread of 10 to the 6, which is easily achievable. I mean, that's no problem at all. Let's say it's a 10 to the 3rd, one part in 1,000. So some eigenvalues are 1,000 times larger than the others. You're dividing by 1,000, okay? You're, you're dividing by, you're multiplying, okay, you're dividing by one part in 1,000. So you're taking some numbers and you're multiplying them by 1,000 and other numbers you're multiplying by 1. But you're going to just amplify the noise, right? You can't do that because it's like, yeah, sure, if you have a filter and the filter looks like this, then yeah, theoretically you can divide by some incredibly small number out here in the, in the stop band of the filter and you can re-equalize and recover that signal. But if there's any noise in there, the noise is going to be amplified like crazy and you're just going to get junk, okay? So this doesn't work, okay? So the maximum estimator doesn't work. The, map, the Bayesian approach works because you're accounting for the prior, okay? And, um, uh, and the map estimate is achieved by minimizing this cost function, which we'll talk about more in, in the next uh, session, okay? And you're going to read the, the notes really carefully, right? So what we're going to do is we're gonna, next time we're going to talk about things like gradient descent which is how you actually do the cost minimization. So with gradient descent, it's like this ball rolling down the hill. The ball rolls in the direction of, um, of, of the steepest direction, okay? So, um, yeah, then, uh, so we're going to talk about that. It seems like gradient descent should be a good method. And guess what? It's not that great. It's actually kind of lousy, okay? So why? Well, it's kind of surprising. But it turns out that moving in the great direction of the steep descent can actually be a bad thing, okay? So we'll understand that, we'll try to understand that, get some intuition, and I'll draw some pictures for you, and it will be great fun. But um, then what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about um, uh, other kinds of optimization methods if the screen will switch, okay? What well, is the screen switching? Oh. Okay. And, and we'll talk about other optimization methods. And um, then we're going to talk about a thing called coordinate things, which is sort of a nice 
So I give you sort of an, a, a flavor of the different approaches, but if you're serious about optimization, you want to take an optimization course. I'm just touching on some basic techniques and seeing how they interplay. And I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye.